So first we're going to look at the PowerPoint. All right, holding the line against Japan. Plans to defeat the Japanese were handled by high commanding officers such as Admiral Chester Nimitz of the US Navy. General Douglas MacArthur led troops in the Philippines to the Bataan Peninsula before surrendering. American troops bombed Tokyo in the Doolittle Raid and the Navajo code talkers were used to create and translate messages without fear of being misunderstood by the enemy. And we're gonna look at some of those more in depth. So the Battle of Midway, Admiral Nimitz ordered carriers to take position near Midway. So the carriers are those big giant flat ships that hold the planes. And on June 4th, 1942, the Americans attacked the Japanese. Aircraft and carriers were destroyed and the battle was a success for the United States. The Japanese advancement had been stopped and a tide had turned in the war. So this is, um, no, we're not gonna get there yet. So in early 1942, U.S. code breakers learned of the Japanese plan to take Midway Island. U.S. Admiral Nimitz sent three carriers to Midway to wait for the arrival of the Japanese fleets. When Japan warplanes began their air assault on Midway on June 4th, 1942, the U.S. forces were ready. So this was unlike the Pearl Harbor battle. When we knew they were going to attack, we weren't sure where, we weren't sure when. We thought it was going to be on the coast of California, but it ended up being Pearl Harbor. Because back then, they didn't quite have the fuel capabilities that we have now. So that's why the planes didn't travel quite as far. So driving back to Japan, defeating Japan called for an attack on two fronts. Admiral Nimitz advanced to the Central Pacific by hopping from island to island. General MacArthur's troops advanced through the Solomon Islands and retook the Philippines. A volunteer group of pilots called the Flying Tigers helped defend China against the Japanese and the Pacific. And kamikaze attacks by the Japanese began at the Battle of Leak Gulf. So let's look at some of these. There we go. So here we're talking about the Battle of Tarawa. So the United States began island hopping across the Pacific, oh my goodness, with, across the Pacific with the Battle of Tarawa in November of 1943. Reporter Robert Sher witnessed the savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A Marine jumped over the seawall and began throwing blocks of fused TNT onto a coconut log pillbox. Two more Marines scaled the seawall, one of them carrying a twin cylinder tank strapped to their soldier, so, shoulders, the other holding the nozzle of the flamethrower. As another charge of TNT boomed inside the pillbox, causing smoke and dust to billow out, a khaki clad figure ran out the side entrance. The flamethrower, waiting for him, caught him in its withering stream of intense fire. As soon as it touched him, the Japanese soldier flared up like a piece of celluloid. He was dead instantly, charred almost to nothingness. So Marines landed on Tarawa's flat beaches, tried to quickly use whatever type of protection they could. On an island where the highest point was only 12 feet, even a sandbag entrenchment was useful. So you can see in this picture, there are sandbags and those are palm trees or some of them were palm trees in the back. This Marine had just thrown a hand grenade in the face of heavy fire from the Japanese. Next to him, a Marine reloads, so this guy's reloading, a machine gun. Throughout the battle, Marines used field telephones to report and receive orders. The Battle of Tarawa was one of the hardest fought in the Pacific. While invading Marines suffered high casualties of almost 3,000, the Japanese defenders suffered even higher numbers. There were only 17 survivors of the 4,700 Japanese defending the atoll. And this map kind of shows you what the island hopping looked like. So we started here. And here, here's Pearl Harbor. So here's Hawaii in relation to Japan and Australia. So you kind of have an idea. And then there's Alaska. And so you can see how close Alaska and Russia are. And so they literally island hopped. 
go from here to here to here all the way up until they made it to Japan. So they slowly took away Japan's stronghold in the Pacific until they finally made it to their island. And we're going to talk at the end of this week or early next week about the, um, the bombs dropped. Flying Tigers. So these planes, if you've ever watched a World War II movie, chances are you've seen one of these planes portrayed. 1937, the wife of China's leader, Chiang Kai-shek, asked retired U.S. Army Air Corps Captain Claire L. Chenault, not a girl, to evaluate the Chinese Air Force. Japan and China were about to face each other in war. Although the United States was not actively involved in World War II at that point, it was building planes for Britain by the early 1940s. Remember the Lend-Lease Act and the um, ships for bases. It was building planes for Britain. Uh, Chennault hoped to get some of those planes with American pilots to China. Most American military leaders strongly opposed Chennault's plan as they wanted to build up America's air forces. However, Chenault had strong support from Frederick, Pre President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. By 1941, the American Volunteer Group, the ABG, formed with pilots and ground crews from the Army, Navy, and Marine Air Services. They helped the Chinese build airfields and develop a warning system for incoming Japanese planes. The ABG and the Royal British Royal Air Force, RAF, joined together to fight the Japanese incursion into China. The AVG whipped the Japanese Air Force in more than 50 air battles without a single defeat. The name Flying Tigers was given to the group in newspaper reports of their successes. Since the planes had been painted to look like sharks, the name remained a mystery to Chenault and the AVG. So now let's talk about the Code Talkers. So the first unit of Navajo code talkers consisted of only 29 men. Most had never been away from home. Many also lacked birth certificates. These were Native Americans. Later, it was learned that some recruits were actually as young as 15 years of age. He looks like a baby, doesn't he? The first group developed the code. Only a trained code talker could decipher the message as the Japanese learned after a captured Navajo serving in the US Army could not translate any messages. Often simple farmers and sheep herders, the code talkers were called walking secret codes by their fellow platoon members. The code talkers were not allowed to write down any part of the code. All transmissions had to be from memory, which was quite a feat amid the chaos of battle. The code talkers were used in every military campaign in the Pacific from 1942 to 1945. The Navajo language base code has the distinction of being the only unbreakable code in modern military history. After the war, the Navajo code talkers returned home. They were heroes, but their heroism could not be publicly celebrated. The code was considered a military secret, so the code talkers could not talk about it with anybody. 1968, the code itself was declassified. It was no longer a military secret. Still, the code talkers who had saved so many lives were overlooked in terms of official US government recognition. Finally, in 2001, the Navajo code talkers received Congressional Medals of Honor. Five of the original 29 who developed the code were still alive. Four of them received the medal personally from then President George W. Bush. Gold Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded to the 29 Navajo who developed the code. Silver Medals of Honor were awarded to more than 500 other code talkers who served in World War II. There's also the movie, the, I think it's called The Code Talkers. It's not a great movie, but it gives you a general idea. So now the last thing we're gonna talk about before I show you a video is the kamikaze rituals. This was from, um, these are Japanese pilots. Kamikaze pilots received ceremonial headbands prior to flying the aircraft on a suicide mission against US naval vessels in the Pacific theater. So that's what kamikaze means. It basically means suicide mission. You go in knowing that you are going to die. Before a mission, kamikaze pilots perform rituals, including praying, 
composing farewell poems and letters and donning headband silk scarves and embroidered belts. The belts worn by kamikaze pilots were called thousand stitch belts. The belt was a strip of cloth into which 1,000 women had each sewn a single stitch to honor the pilot's sacrifice. The kamikaze attacks were both desperate and deadly. During the battle for Okinawa, kamikaze attacks killed nearly 5,000 Americans, the greatest U.S. Navy loss in a single naval engagement. So now we're going to watch this video that's going to explain more about the war in the Pacific, and it has some actual footage. This sound, right? In nineteen, this sound. The Pacific Theater of War is known for some of the most important major battles during World War II. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Doolittle Raid on Japan in 1942. The Battle of Midway in 1942. The Battle of the Coral Sea in 1942. The Battle of Guadalcanal in 1943. The Battle of Saipan in 1944. The Battle of Iwo Jima in 1945. And the Battle of Okinawa in 1945. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had done devastating damage to the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Almost all the battleships were either damaged or out of action. Battleships were the command ships of any naval strike force, meaning the capabilities of the U.S. Pacific Fleet were severely crippled after Pearl Harbor. However, the U.S. defeat at Pearl Harbor did have a silver lining. The Japanese forces had missed the U.S. carriers and submarine fleet. The U.S. would have to defend the Pacific with aircraft and submarines until the Pacific battleship fleet could be repaired and put back into action. In addition, the type of warfare would have to be very different from Europe. Japan's empire stretched over a vast area of Pacific islands, so victory would require a strategy called island hopping. Island hopping was a strategy where the United States Navy would heavily bombard islands, followed by a landing of U.S. Marines. Once the Marines had rooted out the Japanese defenses and captured the island from the ground, U.S. forces would then move on to another island closer to Japan, using each island as a stepping stone until they could eventually stage an all-out invasion of Japan and bring an end to the war. In addition, the United States would need the help of their Australian allies in the South Pacific in order to pull off a victory against the Japanese Empire. As America turned its sights on the Pacific, it saw some early victories. The first such victory was the Doolittle Raid. Four months after Pearl Harbor, 16 U.S. planes pull off a daring bombing raid on Tokyo. Since Japan was so far away, the United States needed to take a new strategy in order to get their bombers near the Japanese mainland. They placed their heavy bombers on the aircraft carriers in order to get close enough to reach Japan. They were able to hit major wartime targets in Tokyo. It lifted U.S. spirits and shocked Japan into the realization that the U.S. could fight back and win. The next battle is the Battle of the Coral Sea. U.S. and Australian forces defeated the Japanese invading force in an all-air battle. This was the first major all-air battle in the Pacific. An Allied victory turned back the Japanese invasion of Australia and kept an important ally safe. Next is the Battle of Guadalcanal. This was the first action seen by U.S. Marines in World War II. Japan held the island of Guadalcanal, which had a vital airfield on it. From this airfield, the Japanese Air Force could reach and bomb Australia. By taking that island, we now remove the threat that Japan had placed on Australia. Perhaps no other battle in the Pacific Theater was as important as the Battle of Midway in 1942. In June of 1942, U.S. forces were patrolling the Pacific in search of the Japanese carrier fleet. With the help of the Navajo Kotakers, that were a group of Navajo tribesmen employed by the Marines to use their ancient Navajo language to confuse the Japanese with code, the United States task forces decoded Japanese messages and pinpointed the exact location of the Japanese carriers. U.S. forces launched a surprise attack on the Japanese carrier fleet. Caught completely off guard, the Japanese carriers and their surrounding task forces were easy targets for U.S. torpedo planes and bombers. By the battle's end, the Japanese had lost four carriers, one destroyer, and 250 planes total. The Allied victory at Midway is a turning point in the war in the Pacific.
The Japanese Navy had lost all four aircraft carriers that fought in the battle, and their aircraft carrier fleet was crippled. This allowed the United States to gain air dominance in the war in the Pacific, which allowed them to begin the strategy of island hopping with air supremacy overhead. If the United States had actually lost Midway, it's quite possible the Japanese would have gained both air supremacy and naval supremacy in the Pacific, putting the United States at a severe disadvantage in a position where they possibly could lose the war. After their significant naval victory in Midway, the United States forces in the Pacific began a major offensive against Japan. The push involved neutralizing or eliminating the threat of the rest of the destroyers and battleships in the Japanese Navy. In desperation, as American forces got closer to Japan, Japan implemented kamikaze attacks. Kamikazes were suicide pilots who, once dropping their payload on U.S. targets, would intentionally crash their planes into U.S. ships in order to inflict damage, even at the cost of their own lives. For Japanese soldiers, conducting a kamikaze attack was a great honor. To die in service of the emperor was seen as one of the greatest sacrifices you could make. But even the kamikazes couldn't stop the U.S. advance towards Japan. The next battle is the Battle of Iwo Jima. In February of 1945, Marines land on the most fortified island on Earth, Iwo Jima. Over 20,000 Japanese were entrenched in defenses. Before the Marines landed, the U.S. Navy conducted a heavy naval bombardment of the island. This did little to soften the defenses, and the landing waves took heavy losses. 6,000 Marines died taking the island, but the Japanese suffered much larger losses. Of the 20,000 Japanese that originated on the island, only 200 survived. The Japanese knew that they were going to suffer huge losses and could not win the battle. Japanese officials told their soldiers to try to kill 10 Americans before they died. The victory was immortalized by the image of Marines rising the flag on Mount Suribachi. General Douglas MacArthur retook the Philippines in 1944. Combined with the victory at Iwo Jima, the United States could now plan an invasion of the last island stronghold outside of Japan. With Iwo Jima taken, the United States forces were knocking on the doorstep of Japan. There was only one island stronghold left to assault, and that leads to the Battle of Okinawa. In April 1945, the United States forces assault the island of Okinawa, only 350 miles off the coast of Japan. About 2,000 kamikaze pilots killed 5,000 U.S. sailors and sunk 30 American ships. Marines on the island of Okinawa faced even tougher resistance than they did on the island of Iwo Jima because tunnels and caves had been dug into the hillsides filled with hundreds of thousands of Japanese soldiers ready to fight until the end. This helps lead Okinawa to become the bloodiest battle for U.S. forces in the Pacific theater. More American men lost their lives at Okinawa than any other Pacific battle in World War II. By June 1945, Three months after the assault began, the United States controlled the island, but at an enormous cost. The U.S. lost over 7,000 men, more men than they had lost at Iwo Jima. Japan lost 110,000 soldiers, including ritualistic suicides. After fighting until the end, Japanese soldiers who knew that they were defeated and possibly could be captured would commit suicide instead of being captured by U.S. forces. Death, even by suicide in defense of the emperor, was seen as honorable. One of the most common ways to kill themselves was to pull the pin of a grenade and hug it tight to your chest until it exploded. This shows the extent to which the Japanese would go to defend their empire, and the tough defense that U.S. Marines faced in the Pacific. Overcoming the severe damage caused to the United States Pacific Fleet at the attack at Pearl Harbor, the United States has successfully employed the strategy of island hop to draw its forces closer to the island of Japan. By 1945, United States forces had taken nearly every island stronghold held by Japan. The time had come to prepare for the invasion of the island of Japan. But with the real possibility of massive casualties, estimated to be a million American soldiers, the United States would consider another means by which to end the war. One that was so secret and so destructive, it would change the world forever. All right, so now what you're going to do is complete the reading essentials, answer discussion question 3-5, take the War in the Pacific quiz, and work on the ingenuity modules. If you have questions, let me know. And now you have control.